um, going to be a very special evening. My name is Joan Lundy Martin. I'm director of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, or CAP. I like to remind people that's two A's and two P's. People like to forget about the poetic part, but it is a part of who we are. Um, this evening will feature a reading and conversation with uh, poets Ricky Laurentis and Terence Haynes. And although we'll feature two poets tonight, um, tonight is, is really about the celebration of the work by Ricky Laurentis, um, the CAP inaugural post-MFA fellow. So um, we're celebrating him by uh, inviting Terence Haynes to read with him. Um, Ricky is in the final months of his two-year fellowship. The CAP post-MFA postdoctoral creative writing fellowship is one of the creative spaces in which CAP hosts the development of new work by poets whose work intersects or is indeed the very thing with African American and African diasporic poetry and poetics. Uh, and the fellow has afforded funding, time, space to do research and think and create at their leisure and to meet and collaborate with Pittsburgh area writers and artists on new projects. And uh, um, Lauren Russell, who's the assistant director at CAP, will introduce Ricky, but I, I just have to say that um, we could not have wished for a better, more, like a person who really took advantage of the time that they've been here in Pittsburgh and really um, built collaborations with a range of artists and dancers and um, and writers and um, folks at the museums. Um, so I'm really grateful uh, for Ricky's presence these past uh, one and a half years. So uh, we'll hear tonight some of what Ricky has been up to um, over these months. Terrence will read after Ricky. Um, we'll have a, a short discussion and we'll try to leave some room for um, audience questions as well, though there are microphones, I believe, in the, uh, in the aisles. Um, and then uh, book sales and book signing will follow. Uh, so before I briefly introduce Lauren Russell, who will introduce Ricky, I want to thank the Dietrich School of the Arts and Sciences and the Dietrich Foundation for its continued support of our, of our work. Um, Lauren Russell is the author of What's Hanging on the Hush, which came out in 2017 from Posada Press. I believe a lot of that she wrote here as an MFA student, um, tooting the MFA uh, program torn. Um, she is a winner of the National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship in Poetry in 2017. And she is a research assistant professor and assistant director at the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics here at the University of Pittsburgh. Please welcome Lauren Russell. Thanks, Dawn. Ricky Laurentis was raised in New Orleans to love the dark. They are the author of Boy with Thorn, which won the Cave Canet Poetry Prize, the Levis Reading Prize, and was a finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award. Other honors include fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the Lennon Literary Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Civitella Ranieri Foundation, and the Poetry Foundation. Their poem, Visible City, opened Notes for Now, the art catalog for Prospect 3 in New Orleans, and he has partnered on other curatorial collaborations or programs with the Museums of Modern Art, the Carnegie Museum of Art, and most recently, the Andy Warhol Museum. Laurentis lives in Pittsburgh and is the inaugural fellow in creative writing at the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics at the University of Pittsburgh. Like Wallace Stevens, I know the dark is crucial, Laurentis writes in his poem, Of the Leaves That Have Fallen. This 50-part poem draws on language from Wallace Stevens like decorations in a nigger cemetery and on images from lynching photographs. What is crucial about the dark? 
The first time I taught Boy with Thorn, I showed my class a clip from Julie Dash's film, Daughters of the Dust, set in the sea islands of South Carolina around the turn of the 20th century. In the clip, three black women have a conversation about rape and lynching while sitting in a tree. Daughters of the Dust is shot in daylight, is dazzling, the sun never sets, even on this shadow conversation in which so much is said in silences, between the crooks of branches. What would happen, I asked, if the exposure in of the leaves that have fallen were reversed? What if it was cast in bright light like Dash's film? Without darkness, my students insisted, the poem would not work. Darkness, with its many shades and, shades and weights, its desires, delights, violences, and unutterable secrets, is both a theme and an orientation in Laurentius's work. It is also the racialized darkness of these United States. In the poem Continuance, written after Mike Brown was killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, Laurentius addresses the darkness, writing, you can enter me, Mr. Dark. Here, darkness is invited to participate in another of Laurentius's obsessions, penetration, with its potential for violence, for pleasure, for transformation. In an essay in the Warhol exhibition catalog for Devin Shimayama's Cry Baby exhibition, Laurentius writes, Penetration, finally, as what makes a pressure in and of, is an eruption of knowledge that leads to eventual eruption. It could kill, it does kill, as did each bullet penetrating Trayvon, Michael, Tamir, but it might also heal. Think of a finger, a hand, pushing into the wound as to pause the flow of blood. Penetration becomes a site of pleasure in feeling myself, where Laurentius writes, on my knees then not, so much kneeled as lying down on my stomach, how I like it, my body became his observatory, a way to knowledge, oh, how I have wanted a man to throw down his strength onto the slight flare of my hips and spike me to the known ground. How I have wanted an expression of desire is as crucial a recalibration as the image of the speaker's body as an observatory, which opens up commanding an expansive view as opposed to, say, the interiority of a tunnel. Once in somebody's kitchen toward the end of a writing program party, Ricky mentioned that he was writing about penetration and suggested that if we flip the perspective, it would be called envelopment. Such a reversal or reframing begins to articulate a poetics of agency. In the Cry Baby catalog, Laurentius writes, Penetration finally must mean more than death, than black injury, than this act, I think, that black flesh, particularly, especially against trans or femme black flesh, is subject to, come up under, or against, decided by. Such, too, is the potential for darkness. Later, in continuance, Laurentius's speaker says to the dark, Aren't you the mirror in which all lights balance? Aren't you the line on which all lines cross? Anything lives in you, so that dark over here can be the dark of Mike Brown full of breath, that the dark right here can be the dark of my own bastard mind, that this dark come closest to my lips is a shadow's knowledge full, not ever empty, charitable as it is wicked, risky as it is good. And considering their own darkness and darkness as plenitude rather than absence, Laurentius embraces the dark as a partner. His poems do not cast light onto shadow so much as they speak into and among shadows, penetrating the very darkness that is penetrating them. Or is it enveloping? Brilliant is often defined, is first defined by Miriam Webster as very bright light glittering, a brilliant light, 
but here the dictionary falls short. Ricky Laurentis's brilliance arises out of the dark, out of silences, unspeakable histories, and lush, fraught, finally articulated desires. It has been our good fortune to have Ricky here this last year and a half as the inaugural fellow in creative writing at CAP. Please join me in welcoming him to the mic. Thorn, first century BC, bronze. One, entered, though his shadow spoke his loneliness like a god. Two, this was new knowledge, the kind he had little business knowing, the mere risk of it making it all the more delicious. Three, a force out confession, a forcing an end. Four, each push with a blood yawn like an opiate, each inch a hermeneutics of the self. Five, would you feed on such hurting? Would you drink so much? Six, was he, was he so terrible a thing to look at? But was looked at? Seven, his face chilled deliberate. His face a question gone unanswered. Eight, there could have been a thorn already in his eye. His tongue scratching its wrong, speaking its six troubles. Nine, how? Ten, there could have been a thorn already inside. The point in his eye, what makes the shadows there acutest when they lift and sprawl. Eleven, I keep thinking of the thorn as a marker sprawler, which shapes the places both excused and forbidden in his body's swamp. Twelve, violence that shall want, violence that shall store and steal inside. Thirteen, the spinario, Fidele, boy with a message, a mission, piccaninny, who would not stop for damage, the old story goes. Fourteen, shame, guilt, spleen, woe, shock, and want. Fifteen, he wanted them gone. I know all his deeper hurts, horror gods, that lush resentment. Sixteen, but failed. They were greater dark, vows of mystery, done things. Seventeen, take it. Don't you have to learn to take it eventually? 18, I told him the thorn was as a key, his body a lock. 19, I made him meet the key up with the lock. Turn, 20, I told him, Ricky, turn. 21, he did, an antichrysalis, a lyric, which is a piece of a prayer visible. 22, until he rewound, a new republic, a kingdom where not savagely he was king. 23, who could bear the wind? 24, who could feel the self demanding the self? 25, who could see his honesty, his face more handsome once the pain combed through, combed like a river too clean for love? 26, violence thou shalt want, violence thou shalt steal and store inside. 27, he would devour it. 28, this was his body. His body finally his. 29, he shut the thorn up in his foot and told his foot, walk. Hello. Um, I hope you can hear me. I've been sick all this week. I've been sick all this week, so I'm trying to push for it for you, but I'm going to speak as loudly as I can. Um, thank you for being here. Okay, I will speak as loudly and as slowly as I can, sir. Thank you. Um, my name is Ricky Laurentis. I'm very overwhelmed to see this large church field of people. Um, I'm very lucky to be reading with Terrence, who picked my book. That wasn't mentioned. Uh, like, this is almost like a full circle. He picked Boba Thorne a couple of years ago, so thank you, Terrence, still for that. Um, and thank you, Cap, for all the things that you've done for me as well. Um, I don't know what just, the man went in the back there and did something with the sound. I don't know what just happened there, but hopefully we'll get through this together and we'll all get a drink and it'll be fun and it'll be lush, it'll be great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's true, I'm obsessed with the dark and I still am. And it occurred to me that I was obsessed with the dark for all of its potential violences and potential harms. Um, but there's also something else true about the dark. It's, it can also hold pleasure. You also do a lot of things in the dark that are for pleasure. So over these past two years, I've been thinking about pleasure. One of those ways is through penetration, but not exclusively. Um, so some of the things I'm going to be reading tonight um, have to deal with that sort of uneasy edge between, I guess, pleasure and pain within the, th within the dark and also without it. So this next poem, I don't even know if I should touch it. I'm not touching it. Um, it's called 2019, as in this year. This year we're in right now, 2019. I can string him back up the tree if you like, return his skin's meaning to an easy distance, coal dust, blaze, and Willie Brown him. You love how the blood muddies the original, 
the way it makes a stage of my speechifying that's leeching capital from his dying like an activist. I know I'm not supposed to sing of his ringing penetrability, some hole I open and pose on the form, but all I see is bullets, bullets discerning him as years ago it was rope. I could pull it tighter, finger each bullet deeper if you like, an inch rougher, far enough to where it becomes that second heat, erotic. I could use the erotic if you like, so ungarish, bearing not too frank a mood, subtle, so you need it. Funny how some dark will move illicit if you close your eyes, the way, say, my pleasure is named too explicit for a page, but this menace I put in it is not. I could yank and knot the rope, if you like, him like a strange fragment in the trees, and the word again spelled out about his neck would be the rope's predicate, till that wild pattern and fierce is moan. It is a tragedy. No, it is a sonnet how I know already how he ends. But I can make him her, if you like, regender them to merely canvas for your empathy, soup for my mouth. Still, if I could but just get this blunt, burnt lynch body up from on out the pocket behind my eyes, all trees could be themselves again, all sound. You will remember in 1919, that was the year of the red summer, uh, which saw, saw um, something close to a thousand casualties um, led by usually mob vigilante violence upon black bodies. And we are, I won't say celebrating, but we're in the 100 year anniversary of that moment. About Surrender, short poem. Not to the boy, not even quite his body, but to his beauty, I heard, you're mine. I don't know what to say. Day threw down as she always will, no remorse and rudely. Birds sang, words became their images. Haunt me, who was speaking? But his beauty then stole away. Beautiful bottom, beautiful shame. The way he writhed beneath the other man argued his loneliness. But he wasn't just a blank measure waiting to sound. However much an O his mouth made, he wasn't just an O. Thrusting back up against what is almost like a finger, though it isn't. Always needing to be touched like a finger to be held. I'm lonely. My waist cinched inward like some vintage Japanese fan, the clever blade of my back working inch by inch toward a pleasure half mine, the way fire pleases, wax pleases. What does possession mean? No, really, tell me that at this moment someone beside myself can feel how many times I shudder. Asked if I like it, I like it. I speak out those three syllables, mess myself. The point is, I think, to empty. It feels good to be two men, no, two bodies interlocked in a sentence still forming. We dance the dance that says, I want you. Come closer, come in me. No, really, he said, as a whisper, boy, no flesh, you want to be possessed. Because, you see, he had been removed from his body then, per usual. His beauty, like a talisman offered, his woundedness revealed. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about bottoms and bottoming and all the sort of ways um, bottoms come up, um, whether in the way I just read in that poem, but also um, notions of rock bottom. Um, you know, Toy Morrison opens up her novel Sula at the, at the bottoms. Um, if you read that novel, it starts at the bottom, but actually it's the town that's at the top. So there's an inversion happening there. Um, I've also been thinking about the bottom of, uh, of slave ships in that sort of hold, in that sort of abject space, that dark space, where we are given to know that violence happened, but there's al also there were other things happening there, like the creation of what we know as blackness was happening in that space. So it was also a productive space, even in the midst of all of this um, violence and chaos and destruction. Um, so this next poem speaks in to and maybe from, if I can venture to say, that, that sort of whole space. And it's called Vernacular is the One Slave You Know. 
And it starts with an um, epigraph by Robert Hayden from his poem, The Middle, Path, Middle, Middle Passage. And it's just the line, mirage and myth and actual shore. Vernacular is the one slave you know. Zipped up gold in the hold of that ship, what they did was fly, crave. Couldn't they have fantasized, shaping minutes to this rough ethics I speak, not English, but a sense of it, a scorpion I ease hearted and raw from my tongue's tip. So myth was them, was art, was jazz already, at least some premature ghost of her was shade with his hundred foul teeth, neat, original, packed down the Atlantic's roaring mouth, afraid to be afraid. But there is one view of the Atlantic slave trade that's just a view of one boy barefooting some further Afric shore to see some ship's flag snap oddly in the wind and men who didn't have their color right. Lipped up smart in the dark of that ship, knowledge what to have but have a photograph's memory. Who can't see his mother's hands as captive beside him stretch hunger for that shit light or hear and her falling sighs the death of the first idea? I say this is true. At bottom, at bottom of the bottom of the ship was a history earned. There's this counsel in my ear that is my ear that says a slave can't know like this, speak like this, descend to be type authentic. But I say someone needs them to, I do, so I write it. Imagine the imagination's power have made this once healthy with desire, not to raise categories, lines, or to kill. One could build a home then, finally. One could resurrect a language light enough to fit our flying into. How y'all doing? Is, is we doing okay? No. My throat hates me right now. It's okay. I'm not always this sad and dark. Like in my actual life, I try to be lively and, and light so that I can be this dark. Um, you know, it's give and take, give and take. But you know what? Let's just do this poem because this is a kind of a, it's kind of a sexy poem. Um, this is a poem that was kind of quoted in the introduction, which was a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, this is called Feeling Myself. Um, you will remember um, Nicki Minaj and Beyonce making a wonderful song calling, you remember this, right? Feeling Myself. Um, uh, and so at one moment in my life, I was listening to that song while I was reading Foucault, and this came out. <laughs> Another short poem. Feeling myself. So it's true that the flesh must confess, must tell and tell again how it hungers or has been moved by hunger. But if I see that the flesh is not only, is not just a discourse, a sex, flesh, as it is a means toward that toward pressure, sense, pleasure of another body's orbit so near, nearer, unimaginary, how not tell it, touch it. On my knees, then not so much kneeled as lying down on my stomach, how I like it, my body became his observatory, a way to knowledge. Oh, how I have wanted a man to throw down his strength unto the slight flare of my hips and spike me to the known ground. See, that's kind of sexy, right? That's not, it's not all sad, you know? All that way. Um, in that same vein, I'm going to read this poem. Uh, I'm not sure yet if this is really an epigraph, but I'll just read it. Walt Whitman once said that the known, the known universe has one complete lover, and that is the greatest poet. And I think that's true, but we'll find out. Um, this poem is called The Making of the Complete Lover. Because there is that moment a man first cometh into a story, as into my arms and just tremble a little at the knowledge of it. Purr, branch in a wind, the boyhood flash just briefly, just hard enough across his otherwise adult face as an easiness returned to him. Then thrill, then industry throw there the way now our safe balance be. This time call it mercy, his name put down upon me, which is his grip, my rippling back into him as first meet me, then erosion, then yes. Yes, I consent to this, to the lie as much as moonlight is light or just a good trick. To enter or be entered, is it real? Does it matter? 
slip of tongue, snake meeting temptation, slip of truth. But we come into knowledge too, I'm told, as in that story, the two of them after sex stepped each into their shame. I can't say if gladly or not, but became themselves. They must have then. Panther in a bush, drip. Now agency enters the plot, grips me harder as at my waist, simply to regard me, yes, or higher as at my neck. So missionary means only this way of sharing good news with another, and the news going where? West? In? It's always been about needing to face such knowledge, hasn't it, against what all we rather not know, that weather. How I'm this second cold, that one sweat, but no speech yet. How he turns me over, yes, beg, I drop it like it, that I let him enter, and can I do? And can I be so throwed in the garden that I falleth like the very door of paradise and ease beyond myself? Good speech, yes. Good trickery, yes. Yes, Daddy. It occurred to me that we need more like poems, and probably R&B songs around consent that are sexy and good. Um, so. That also, it's, I, that also became a part of the things I wanted to do as well. Um, I'm going to read just a couple more poems and then run away. Um, this poem um, I wrote this, um, I, well, I should say, I did my graduate school, I did my graduate work in St. Louis, and I graduated in 2013. And then in 2014, the city sort of literally exploded. And I never liked St. Louis, but it was at that moment I realized why. I, had no, I have no real issue with St. Louis, right? I had no real issue with the community. I found that I had an issue with what I was sensing as the real um, sort of racial uh, confusion and violence happening beneath the layer, beneath the surface. And I'm not unfamiliar with that. I'm from New Orleans. I mean, I'm from America, so it's not unfamiliar territory. Um, but it was unfamiliar because I was in the Midwest, which is not given to speaking of itself in that sort of way. And so I just had to get out. So once I did get out, I was actually out of the country doing a residency when it sort of blew up. And I felt I had, I've had what I would call like a Baldwin moment when I'm looking back at the country or the place I was walking, sort of literally on fire. Um, and so I wrote this poem. Um, and so I'm referring to, if you don't remember, um, and you should, um, the murder of Michael Brown. Um, and I don't think I need to go into the details of that. Um, but what struck me was the image that became viral of his body without agencies just sort of on the ground. Um, and I still can't really contend with why. I mean, there are reasons why I can say why. But there's something that only this poem got to me understanding why that, that sort of viral image stuck in my head. So this is called Continuance. 2014, Ferguson, Missouri. Forever here, Mr. Dark, and tricking me, steaming from a manhole in Missouri, or else you're damp between the motions of the trees, revealing the breezy discourse of those trees, black sound. I can see now how everything I've learned of you is wrong, how an air of dumb assumption lounged on my brow, a liar winking, claiming a shadow is as empty as my childhood vision of the falling sun meant emptiness. But every child knows what moves the wind at night, knows what leads some birds to develop their unrest in the high green of some trees, or lower, what leans against that tree's bark. A man? Or is it the just barely intelligible idea of one? Head back, maybe eyes closed, moaning, working to hysteria, the erection rising like a haunted chain away from him. If I move closer, carrying a glass cup, if my mouth is that cup, though I've known fear move as bravely in this world, move like a physical man, it can shoot a boy. So shoot me. Who said that? Was it really the black of my tongue? But how could any breed of blackness ever wish to be penetrated? I could tell you how a foot creaks even falling dead in the night, could tell the red a mother cries when she feels that absence drop like pity inside her, but I cannot say what a bullet says as it enters a child's skin. But come in. You can enter me, Mr. Dark. 
Let tonight be the first night I deeper see the pregnant possibilities of your design, how your fingers move to build such attitudes, turning a moaning of the wind into a man, making what is a tease of grass at the hill into terror, now pleasure, then back to grass again. Aren't you the mirror in which all lights balance? Aren't you the line on which all lines cross? Anything lives in you, so that the dark over there can be the dark of Mike Brown still full of breath. That the dark right here can be the dark of my own bastard mind. That this dark come closest to my lips is a shadow's knowledge. Full, not ever empty. Charitable as it is wicked. Risky as it is good. Fascination, perversion, and I move to it. To you, a shadow chaser. Hearing the birds make restlessness in the trees. Watching the man stroke velvet from his body. Head still back, maybe eyes parted. He's singing now. He's at that point when I must surrender my knees to gravity and mouth ready, get gone. I'll choose what ground I lie on. Sorry if I'm drinking too much water. <laughs> um, I will read three more poems and then run away. Um, not run, I mean, these heels are too high to run, but I'll skip away. Um, <laughs> I will read this poem, which is a very new one. Um, there's no introduction, per se, um, but it does have an epigraph from the poet, the Palestinian poet, um, Mahmoud Darish. He says, what doesn't resemble me is more beautiful. More beautiful. <clears throat> Let's see. Attempt at the harder thinking. So what in Bethlehem I tried against it? Was still the lonelier aches I've known spirit and say, no, you will compare it. I compared it. I mean, I leaned into a kind of pity then, felt a distance dilate my eyes and cried. So what I did not ask for as not to cheapen sissy it, but was a new privilege I met as salt slipped down and furthered my face. American and then black began to describe me. Imagine that. I was some double consciousness again. Me watching four boys swing their joy on an old couch on wheels before the walls for stalling future. And who greeted them first was not me, just them tears. Panic, I could call a coin for this side that's guilt, that side friendship. Or is it my voice insisting the story and whispering, warring into father, blood like dew in the fields. But the story is true. Killings are thrilling, the wall said, and casual. One little infant crying, one little infant trying, two women in their three dogs sleeping, four boys. Do you not find yourself mistaken now? The birth of a nation means always the death of a former one. I felt that. I was persuaded. The film peeling across my eyes, only one Palestine made protests against this fact untenable, as if myself I could see in those fields saw too the theft and strangle of myself. What's solid in solidarity? All I know is still nooses, crosses, still thorns. Then it was white phosphorus forming the quick shadow of a boy called Taxis running. Admission is a later knowledge, I think, a slower one. To know, it was, to know it was my want to see myself as that boy I was seeing, that ache again and in myself to want to check hurt, checkpoint. Light slides across the face of a body, dark does. The next shot is familiar, rows of cotton dipped in historical red, burnt cork crows, rows of bullets tipped into some resembling skin, but Try again. They were, sh they were soldiers I was seeing, Israeli, only this very much in my face, present tense. I should loathe this gravity, these easy collisions, the way an eye carries down a page down the shallow energy of my voice because I bit it to the hilt, semicolons dangling for how the dead do dangle and give pause. I should spit. I should want the harder thinking, unmannered like some romantic self that only occupies my brain, desire, pleasure. These words I repleasure into existence, but would I fail? Let's say the freedom of fiction can be the danger of it, then, could be the draw. 
tried in Jerusalem, tried in Hebron, but I saw everything I needed in the labored chain work of the overhanging canopies that keeps rocks from, from falling on the shopkeepers' heads below, took a video of the Palestinian man who told me, tell it. Who wants a pacifying gospel delivered knows I cannot please them. I mean, I cannot stop this ego rolled down my cheeks. Who asked for witness? I first saw myself with the shame I took fully for myself those years ago, but look at that. I was written away from it. A free world, I think, is possible. I am persuaded. I saw it in the still for singing beauty of the land, how Palestine makes a gold hum in my mouth. Saw it in the rolling hills of Ramallah, my feet at least tried against, at least they tried and felt some resonance. Checkpoint. What would I imagine there? Checkpoint. What new body could we own? Checkpoint. What are the costs of failure? Checkpoint. If I be willing to fail, ye did. Let it be then. Let it be then. Let it be then for beauty. A few years ago, I had the miraculous opportunity to visit Palestine in 2016. Um, and I've been trying to write that poem, and I still am ever since. And I'm going to end with... Thank you. This has been a struggle, but a beautiful struggle, hopefully. Um, I'm going to end, since we're in a church, with a hymn, as in a church hymn. Hymn. There's a valley a man's work back makes, and there's a violence too. There's a river a man's low voice makes, and there's a violence too. There's a falcon a man's fierce attention makes, and there's a violence, too. There's a way a man will turn at you, wakes begging, I'm hurt, and there's his violence, too. Turn, sudden color, beg, I alone, blameless, am hurt, and that's a violence, too. There's a moment I'll say, listen, and all his violence chooses not to hear it, so that choice, blameless, random, red, becomes a violence, too. Men choose the violences they deliver like mirrors choose the subjects of their debt. We look in them and what is it we think we see? Pride, prejudice come up his throat, a kiss to take all the while and quick the nearest man's side or his business or his stranger argument or any benefit of doubt or his acumen or his wit and of course he won't admit it but his violence too. All men have it taken in even, even how I do. I seek a violence too. That I try not, but I repeat it in what casualty I say, in what casualness I take to say no or say please, and all this time a certain ease with being the one unliked. Though lately, what I am trying to make makes sense in me, more feral and more film is all upset, and not a man, and hardly was, and fell and failed it down, and sees no more the purpose for the violence in that claim. A man turns to you and claims he alone is hurt, as if it isn't possible his tall hubris hurt him first. Why be a man when there are valleys you can be? Penetrate and you can walk them. Take in their honest, honest expanse of the primer nature and see some shy, river, shy ribbon of river move in patient wakes the very line a falcon takes returning to the falconer. Why be a man when it's the very idea of flight you can be? Up tight in that fell space contesting the mirror, its very half shadow now bruising the ground as it chooses the ground, not on earth, but in itself. I think it means we can be some other work than we were raised, that I can strike out him for him, and all that's violence too. For it's easy enough to conquer a man. I look in his eyes and grow pathetic. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for that wonderful reading. Um, so I had written this whole intro this afternoon, and you know, I was taking part of Terrence's bio, the official bio, and you know, putting in the accolades like in, in the body of the intro that I had written. And then on the way over here, and the, I picked him up at the hotel and brought him over here. He was like, "Don't read the all those awards and things. You know, I don't want. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear the word MacArthur." So. <laughs> <laughs> So then, just like five minutes ago, or you know, a few minutes ago, I rewrote the intro, so I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. Some of it remains, but most of it I just scribbled. Um, we'll see if it 
if it makes any sense. I think I need my glasses for this. Thing. Um, but you know, you can Google him if you want to know more than prizes in MacArthur. I'll just say that. Um, I believe it was 1998 when Terrence and I first met during my first year as a Cave Canem fellow. He had already completed his three years, I believe, and he was then working as the Cave Canem intern. I think that's right. And truth be told, we didn't really meet per se, but I was aware of him. He was already kind of legendary. The poems that would make their way into his first book, Muscular Music, were simply, when I heard them at those Cave Canem readings, magnificent. The way they balanced that crucial edge between manipulated colloquial speech and the elevation of speech one brings to poetry. Since then, of course, Terence Hayes has gone on to produce an incredible body of work. Now, just footnote, you go to the internet. Um, what draws me to Terence's work, and I would include his visual art too, um, is in part its unpredictability, its coax and invitation via this unpredictability. In The Art of Daring, the poet Carl Phillips writes, there is the kind of sex that is less about power than about the unpredictability and the flexibility with which that power gets divided between and among the parties involved. He's writing about poetry here and about how when the poem really does its work well, there's a dynamic of risk involved for the writer, the text, and the reader. Terence Hayes' poems render this, in, in my view, gorgeous dynamic so that there are no moments when we are, or few, I guess, you know, when we are comfortably situated. Instead, we are lured towards balancing on some edge, some precipice, trusting that even if we are dropped, it will be worth it. Let me get back to my story. I could never imagine in 1998 that Terence and I would be friends um, I was very busy fashioning myself as an outsider causing trouble. And it was really here in Pittsburgh where Terrence and I became friends. It's unlikely because, I think, because he's a male Scorpio and I'm an Aries um, woman of sorts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think it happened because we were deeply interested in each other's creative minds or the creative minds that we could see in each other's poems. How would we speak to each other outside of these poems in real life and time? Perhaps this is the truest gift of the life of a writer, that an unpredictable crossing over, that unpredictable crossing over, the risks it takes to try to know, like in that quote from Darwish, someone unfamiliar. It is um, my great pleasure to welcome back to the University of Pittsburgh my friend, Terrence Hayes. This whole thing with this little bit of water. So let me see. That means I don't want to talk too much. And then we can do a Q&A. Thanks, Don. Wow, I feel exactly the same way. That was great. Um, it is good to be back. Cap, it's great to read with Ricky. It's great to see friends, familiar faces. Uh, I don't think I have any enemies in, in Pittsburgh. It's a uh, place I think of as home. Um, it's because, you know, it's where I became a poet, so that makes it home. So, okay, so I'm gonna read you uh, some poems from the book, and then I have some of the poems that I wrote like after the book came out, because shit is still crazy, y'all. You know, like I'm going around, and people are like, oh yeah, he wrote these poems about Trump, and, Great. I'm like, but it's still the same way, you know? Like, so all last year, uh, when certain things would happen, I would still write them. And uh, I think I got to stop, you know? So I decided no more for 2019, no more signs, because I'm not going to make another book. Um, but I put them together over this break, and I thought, well, it's Pittsburgh, you know? If I screw up, y'all still like me. I think I got a little bit of <laughs> investment. Um, because my, you know, my editors would say never read anything that they can't get, right? So, but I'll let you know. I'm going to read poems from the book, um, 
and then I read, you know, maybe an equal number of these uh, poems that are still contending, contending with things. Actually, I'll, I'll say this too because I'm not going to talk once I start reading. Uh, the last one in this set that I just put together was just in the New Yorker, and it was called uh, "American Sonnet for the New Year." So what I'll say is, like, I did really think I was stopping because I do think uh, perhaps something has changed. Like, I think, I think that motherfucker's gonna be out of there. I mean, <laughs> within the year. I mean, we're hoping. So that was what I was thinking in December, because you know, like my 408K lost a bunch of money and shit, you know, stocks are going down. I was like, oh, this motherfucker's gonna be out of here because he's messing with people's money. Like, that's people's only standard is money. So, you know, so we'll see, we'll see. I'm not sure. Um, so that's to say, in this, trying to end the set and trying to do something else. Uh, that last poem that I read to you is slightly different and I do think it's the, the end. So that's my experiment. I have not done this before. Um, so I'll start with the stuff that I really know. And uh, I mean, this one, the first one is just kind of give you a definition of what these things are. Um, they're coming from all kinds of places. And so a couple of times, I mean, you may be able to tell it. Sometimes I'm just actually just trying to say like, what is an American sonnet, what's going on, how does one contend with these two things, you know, in this sort of environment that we're in, like we come and we hang out, we hear poetry, and then, you know, like, we are like really in some strange times. So trying to contend with that, like how to be a poet when, you know, this man is your president. All right. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I lock you in an American sonnet, part prison, part panic closet, a little room in a house set aflame. I lock you in a form that is part music box, part meat grinder, to separate the song of the bird from the bone. I lock your persona in a dream-inducing sleeper hole while your better selves watch from the bleachers. I make you both Jim and Crow here. As the Crow, you undergo a beautiful catharsis, trapped one night in the shadows of the gym. As the gym, the feel of Crow shit dropping to your floors is not unlike the stars falling from the pep rally posters on your walls. I make you a box of darkness with a bird in its heart. Voltas of acoustics, instinct, and metaphor. It is not enough to love you. It is not enough to want you destroyed. Raise it up. How's that? Is that better, y'all? Can y'all hear me? I'm just moving around too much. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. So actually when I read some of the other poems, you'll hear certain refrains come up. Like there was another James Baldwin poem that I wrote because he's on my mind a lot. But I was like, I already got a James Baldwin poem in the book. Should I? So I'll read that one later too. Um, but this is the one that made it into the sequence. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Seven of the 10 things I love in the face of James Baldwin concern the spiritual elasticity of his expressions. The sachet between left and right eyebrow, for example. The crease between his eyes like a tuning fork or furrow, like a riverbed branching into tributaries like lines of rapturous sentences searching for a period. The dimple in, her ch in his chin narrows and expands like a pupil. Most of all, I love all of his eyes and those wrinkles, the feel and color of wet driftwood in the mud around those eyes. Mud is made of simple rain and earth, the same baptismal hills and spills of dirt James Baldwin is made of. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Our sermon today concerns the dialectic blessings in transgression and transcendence. We are on the middle floor where the darkness we bury is equal to the lightness we intend. We stand in the valley and go to our knees on the mountains. 
One rope pulls a body down and into earth, the other pulls up and after stars. To be divided is to be multiplied. Let us ponder how it is that you and I have remained alive. Mississippi and all the seas bound to sky by rain, the root and reach of all the trees. When the wound is deep, the healing is heroic. Suffering and ascendance require the same work. Our sermon today sets the beauty of sin against the purity of dirt. All right, I got to parse up this water. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Something in the metaphor of the bow which is never close enough to see the arrow hit its mark. I remain a mystery to my father. My father remains a mystery to me. Christianity is a religion built around a father who does not rescue his son. It is the story of a son whose father is a ghost. No one mentions Jesus' sister. Nothing is written about her. She had no children. She was in her 40s the first time she turned water into wine. A late bloomer, she began a small wine business and traveled all over the world selling the wine. Her name was the name of the wine. I don't recall the name of the wine. <laughs> American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The song must be cultural, confessional, clear, but not obvious. It must be full of compassion and crows bowing in a vulture's shadow. The song must have six sides to it and a clamor of voters. The song must turn on the compass of language like a tangle of wire endowed with feeling. The notes must tear and tear. There must be a love for the minute and the minute. There must be a record of witness and daydream, where the heart is torn or feathered and tarred, where death is undone, time diminished, the song must hold its own storm and drum and shed a noise so lovely it is sung at sunset weddings, baptisms and beheadings henceforth. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The umpteenth thump on the rump of a badunkadunk stumps us. The lunk, the chump, the hunk of plunder, the umpteenth horny, honky stump speech pumps a funky rumble over air. The umpteenth slump in our humming democracy, a bumble bureaucracy with teeny tiny wings too small for its rumpled dumpling of a body. Humpty dumpy, frumpy suit, the umpteenth hump of hollow Thunder, the umpteenth believe me, the umpteenth grumpy, jumpy retort, chump change, casino game, tuxedo, teeth bleach, stump speech, junk science, junk bond, junk country, stump speech. The umpteenth boast stumps our toe. The umpteenth falsehood stumps our elbows and eyeballs, our nose and woes and wows and woes. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Suppose you could speak nothing but money and acrimony. Suppose all the sunflowers Van Gogh destroyed, all the stones in Virginia's pockets, all the stones Georgia painted as vaginas, were simply a, master, a matter of making something greater than money. Prince taught us a real man has a beautiful woman in him. Sometimes, Suppose we cannot forget what happened in money. Suppose you're someone who celebrates Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Suppose he was someone whose love for a black woman was blinded by blackness, hers and his, yours and mine. I ain't mad at you, assassin. It's not the bad people who are brave, I fear. It's the good people who are afraid. 
Just a few more from the book. Am I bouncing around too much? Can y'all hear me? All right. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. But there never was a black male hysteria. As if being called nigger never makes you disappear. As if the fear of other people never makes you levitate. As if the nuzzle of a bullet can't poke a hole in your breath. As if you cannot drink from the river when into the river you disappear and water floods the hole in your breath. You make shit, you piss, you calculate mistakes. You can turn stone into metal. You are able to breathe wind. Air touches your skin like medicine and you disappear. It's crazy. It's as if you are not being hunted by hysteria. It's as if your death is never death. You appear, you appear to disappear, you disappear. All right. Um, let me try. <laughs> These, uh, wow, okay. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. The people before us versus the people behind us versus the people who come after us. The people used to choosing the wrong answers versus the people busy asking the wrong questions. A police state of emergency exit to the rear of the building versus a country of law and order, the burger and fries. A state of grace under fire extinguisher versus a state of grace under fire from the hip versus a state of grace under fire in the belly of the beast of burden. A state of fire in the back of the mind, your business as usual suspects versus fire in the back to basics versus fire in the back away versus fire away. Brother, maybe don't run away. If they gonna shoot you anyway, make them look you in the face. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. A bizarre b-boy ballad goes out to my half-blood brothers, also known as Young Kilo and Slim Thug, online, photographing themselves, bare-chested and lovelorn, basking in pimp poses and nicknames fake as fake fur and blinging. This is for your forlorn forewarnings your dim forecast and broadcast and miscast catcalls to nose rings and tongues pierced by studs fat as tonsils. You flex as in a YouTube rap video shot on a cell phone in a den of b-boys jiving and smoking bearing terrible tattoos of birth dates, heroes, area codes, verses, fonts of baby names, ex-girlfriends, mama names, the deceased, or simply R.I.P. on the tit or wrist. This is for your heartache by way of booze, blues, and booze. Your bash and bluster, ash and luster, bewilder, wilder, brothers, my loves, my brothers, my blood. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The only single women widows now, or brides half married to the breeze. We lie to stay together. We lie to make do. We lie to break the truth apart. We lie to shake the fruit from the trees. My mother favored the worker bee. Her love buzzed with stickiness and sting. I'm here about the widow afraid of butterflies. A widow knows ruin must be as comprehensive as rain, a kind of cover for the dirt about the dead. Nature does not destroy, only change. Get down on your knees and pray and get up quickly and live to celebrate that. Falling is the first and most important skill in many things. How to fall without breaking, as well as how to break. Tell me what you pray when you are broken or break. 
American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. <clears throat> what does your average white James Baldwin fan in line to see I am not your Negro really know about Negroes or Baldwin, the boy preacher who lifted himself out of poverty with a silver tongue? His face was a feat of clairvoyant emotional motions. His chain smoking barely cloaked his cautions. His visage was the color and feel of wet driftwood. His big eyes often looked lost, absorbing, self-absorbed. His poise was sometimes mistaken for haughtiness. His shyness could be mistaken for meekness, except the most elegant sentences swirled from the gap in his smiling, smelling of tobacco and brimstone. As, as existential as a blue note, a testimony, as witness, blackness whistled through the gap in James Baldwin's teeth. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Tangling with death in a pool of my history, no one was with me. In the wet bark of a dark dog jaw, in the pulled eye of the dumb gun a hick merchant sold me before he tried selling me a rifle for scarring or scaring the thieves intending to theft my life and my mama grief and both daddy's sadnesses, the poplar stars who choked on the vomit of stars, the water poplar trees, the daffodil assassins, and fuck, Lord, all the droop and dust of cemeteries where all history is buried. I love as much as I hate growing old and aching as my body turns turns on me. Death takes the Amen brothers but leaves their stories. Death takes the leaves but leaves the waterless poplar trees. I love as much as I hate all death takes from me. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. Because I smiled but never spoke my love to you, I dreamed of Lorca riding a horse with broken teeth on his way to become a firing squad's target. Neither horse nor poet was afraid. One lived with the mouth full of bullets, the other lived with the mouth around a bit. I tried to warn my assassin against framing events as beginnings, middles, and endings, better situation, circumstance, and condition. Black Jack beats bone again. Black Jack breaks bone sometimes. The bone is beaten blind as a blackjack. Lay me with my back to the shoulder of a suburban, urban, abandoned roadside when the police riot. Lay the whole moon like a white knee against my chest. Lorca's teeth are more powerful than the bullets of his assassins. I haven't said what I wanted to say about it yet. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. You are foul as a fragrant vagrant. You are flagrant as when Hackershack commenced. I always felt sorry for Shaquille. You are foul as the air, era, and eras of war. You are foul. You sniff, but you don't inhale. You don't talk to yourself. You don't listen. You don't think God can read minds. You are foul as cologne commercials, suggesting women will love a man simply because of his smell. L-O-L. You are foul as much as television succeeds because it does not emit the smell of your bullshit. Foul as the opposite of an infant smelling a first breath, the smell with the soul inside it. You are foul as the opposite of that. Brother, you foul as a smell so poisonous it kills whoever smells it. Uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, I, I would just really get carried away. <laughs> American signing for my past and future assassin. Side effects include dry spells, dry coughs, dry eyes and crying, photosensitivity, blurred vision, trouble sleeping, trouble with gravity, cold feet, weight gain, weight loss, hair loss, blood lust and blood loss, memory loss, loss of appetite, belly aches, headaches, heartaches, back aches, bruises, blueness, 
redness, whiteness, discoloration, itching, wrinkling, slouching, lying, backbiting, a taste for metal, a taste for meddling and mixed messaging, a taste for witches brews brewed by the motherfuckers who slew all the witches. Side effects include blockages and blockades, a blockhead of state your business as usual, a blockhead strong arm of the law, a warhead shotgun point and shoot down fallout shelter. Side effects include nausea, dizziness, numbness, dumbness, dementias, deletions, leeches, leches, hexes, hoaxes, Hocus pocuses, and if there is justice, spiritual, moral, federal, state, and local charges. And I think this is uh, the last. Uh, I'll, I'll try this one, and then I'll end with the New Year one. American sign it for my past and future assassin. But we can become human, being the light. Our father makes us fire. Our mother makes us ice. What our father makes us, we pour over forests. We burn the woods, covering the hills and valleys until the air is light. What our mother makes us, we drink inside. We taste the metal rusting on a knife thrown in a river. We taste the pepper. We taste the weed still. Water seized with fear becomes transparent as ice anyway. An easy way to kill people is with water, which is wild, since water is also the source of life. Water in the valley, water in your heart. You can walk with rain on your lashes without a care or error or air. You can sleep on the bed of a river like a knife. All right. Yeah, I should have tried that one. All right, so this is the last one. Um, American Sonnet for the New Year. It's good to be here. Good to see y'all. Uh, looking forward to a little bit of time to talk. Things got terribly ugly incredibly quickly. <laughs> Things got ugly embarrassingly quickly, actually. Things got ugly unbelievably quickly, honestly. Things got ugly seemingly infrequently, initially. Things got ugly ironically, usually awfully carefully. Things got ugly unsuccessfully, occasionally. Things got ugly mostly, painstakingly, quietly, seemingly. Things got ugly beautifully, infrequently. Things got ugly sadly, especially, frequently, unfortunately. Things got ugly increasingly, obviously. Things got ugly suddenly, embarrassingly, forcefully. Things got really ugly regularly, truly quickly. Things got really incredibly ugly. Things will get less ugly, inevitably, hopefully. So, is, is it working? Hello, hello? Perfect. Um, I did not neglect to mention that, um, I was going to bring it up later, that you um, chose Ricky's first book for a poetry prize. Um, and I actually wanted to start, we'll start soft. I wanted to start by, I think it's a really special relationship. Um, it's a weird relationship um, between poets. I think it exists mostly in the poetry world. Your first book is often selected by somebody. You may, or you don't know them. They select your book. Um, and then you, you have this, kind of benefactor in a way who's put your first book into the world. So I'm going to start with you, Ricky. I wanted to just ask you about that special relationship. Like, what that's like for you? It's different, right, than like somebody who you've studied deeply, you know, like in a day program. So, so what is it like? Um, I think it's cool. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I disagree. I think I have studied. I mean, I can tell you a little short story. Um, uh, when I submitted my, my manuscript, um, okay, let me backtrack. There is a kind of uh, world in which if you're an you know, you know, emerging poet, you have a manuscript, you send your manuscript out to him where hopefully it gets picked up. Not the case for me. I didn't have that kind of money, and I, I wasn't going to do it. 
I didn't have an attention span, I didn't have the time. Um, so I just kind of kept my poems, worked on it for years by myself. And then one year came, and I can't explain it beyond this, it just, the manuscript just said, oh, it's time. And I sent it into four places, and it went. And I sent it into those four places because the people there, um, I didn't know any of them personally, but I had read their work and I thought two things. Um, they could possibly see something in my work, and also I want to be seen beside their work, right? So I thought um, when Terrence was uh, judging the Hell Prize, which was my top pick, <laughs> so it worked out really well. Um, it just made sense to send it there. Um, and I was actually, I mentioned that I was um, doing this residency up the country when I wrote that poem I was in that, which was literally, it was in Italy. And I remember Nicole called me up at midnight, you know, kept calling me. Nicole is the uh, president of um, Club of Um And she kept calling me. I was like, girl, what's going on? Like, what's happening? Why are you calling me like this? And she's like, your book, Tina, pick your book. And I was like, oh, that's great. I got to go back to sleep. And then the next morning, I woke up more. So I think that that was, um, that initial moment for me was uh, not that I knew, you can never know, but it was something said to me before it happened, it was time. So I said that to like, I know I have some students, I know I have people up there like, patience is a very important part of the process. Um, and since then, um, I think Terrence and I are friends. I mean, we've, we had fights, you know, I know we're friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we still stay up here, so I need you back then. Well, it's good. It's a mess later. Actually, I actually wrote up. Um, I don't know, that's all I'll say. Um, I would say, like, how does one evaluate art? If you do a lot of contests, what would you be looking for? Like, is talent enough? It's not because talent is pretty abundant. Um, but for me, sometimes I go to work and I see something very new, like another planet, another sensibility. But how I know a specialist that I said, like, oh, you know, up here, up here. And so my relationship is always, you know, ask for, aspiring to something like that peer relationship, which means like I just wait for the poems, I sit like everybody else to hear them, I'm a fan, um, but it's not often that you have that, so sometimes it's very distinct, and so anytime I'm in the audience with Ricky, I'm listening to the poems and the mind that's driving those poems, and you know, it's scholarly, but it's also Southern, um, it's vulnerable, but it also is like sharp, you know, and so that kind of sensibility, I mean, I, if I was trying to make a list of where else I would get that, it's just not that many places um, in poetry where I can just say, I go out with Ricky and I'll listen to this instead. So that means that someone that you hope, you know, you can spend as much time as possible, but really just to kind of both encourage that work and also just, you know, be next to it, as he said. He's talking about being next to uh, certain kind of people. And I think like a real poet, I always want to just be next to other poets. Um, and that really doesn't have that much to do with age. Let's talk about the lyric. I was, um, I, I, I've been finding myself in this in odd context lately where for some reason I have to defend the power of the lyric. Um, and so I want to ask you about the power of the lyric, either writ large or in your own poetry, especially when it comes to um, writing about things that one might not ordinarily say seeing. It, it, it could be penetration, it could be, you know, uh, difficult political things. Um, yeah. But doesn't everybody say like, you probably say this with poetics too, does not everybody say, what the fuck is a lyric? It's like, we're gonna talk about a lyric, let me know what that is, what is a lyric? <laughs> Same thing, the poetics. So the first thing I would say is like a definition of lyric is always an interesting conversation just by itself. Like what about it? Just can't even can't people even agree on what it is. I basically like if I'm talking to you know maybe my grad students, but certainly if I'm talking to undergrads about it, I'll say like well narrative is a straight line. You know you woke up, you went to school, you came home, and then sometimes something will happen in that straight narrative of your day to day. And that's your point. So then you get like a little pyramid that you know, the three acts of drama, you know, uh, exposition climax. So all of that is to say, that's just narrative. We all know stories because they're implicit in our lives. But this other thing, which is harder for people to grasp with because it's a little more 
while even, and I think you get a lot of this kind of lyric thinking in Ricky's work, is the circularity of lyric. So lyric is like a song, you know, that's why songs have a frame, but they keep taking you back to this same moment, even though the moment changes a little bit. So there's my definition of lyric. So when you say, what is going on with the lyric, I would say like, oh, a lot of those sonnets are outside of time. They're trying to contend with refrains that are coming through. And these days, as I've stopped trying to write them, I have tried to get back to more of a kind of narrative line, an allegorical line, just more to kind of tell a straight story. So that's where I am now. But to me, that's almost a very writerly response. I don't know, again, if people care even what that means. You just like, is the poem good or not? But um, I would say a lot of what's happening previously has been very much contending with uh, circularity, obsession. That's why they're all the same title. Uh, confusion, reading between the lines, overlap. So that's kind of what the lyric is for me. Yeah, um, I, it's hard for me to like, it's hard for me to define lyrics, and I almost don't want to define lyrics, um, for reasons that Terry said. Um, I also think that it's, I mean, everything was like a queer thing, but lyric to me works in the same way that queer does, as opposed to using academic discourse and also a social discourse, by which I mean that it's easier to understand about what, what it's not versus what it is. Um, but I can describe its effects, right? I can describe, like, like the lyric to me, I'm, I'm obsessed with its obsessions and how it like, sort of pinpoints on something supposedly out of time, but, you know, kind of like collapses or like punches against time. I like its incantatory aspects. It's like, I love that it's seductive, um, even if not always persuasive in the way that the essay is. Um, I like that it still seduces you, if it's good, right? If it's not, I don't know. Uh, which is why I brought up the point about um, like consent, right? Which is uh, which is like we we hear that all the time, like these discourse today, and I think it's very important. But it's also true that you don't find like I was literally trying to make a playlist. I make playlists all the time, like just to help me walk through the poem. And I try to make a playlist like, around consent, and, like my favorite R&B. I challenge you all to do this, and it was hard. Like there, <laughs> there just aren't like a lot of songs, beautiful songs. So what, what it looked like to make lyrics go around, around consent. Um, not just sexually, but just consent of all kinds of things. Um, that is seductive and persuasive and beautiful so that it becomes a part of the flesh of it and not just this word that we hear in the, um, some like say PC, I hate people say that, or political or what have you. Um, so I like the lyric for all the things that can do that, which isn't to say that narrative can't do that, it's just I'm not interested in, in doing it myself. So that was one relationship and mentor question, one craft question. Now I have one process question. I'm asked five questions, and I'll turn it, then I'll turn it to the audience. Uh, but can we all talk to each other? I mean, you may even want to ask each other questions. Right? I don't know. Um, so I, when you were uh, reading and contextualizing your work, Ricky, you were talking about um, thinking. You just mentioned thinking about concepts of botany. And so then I started thinking, I started thinking about the role that, of thinking in the creative process. Um, it made me think of, uh, I wrote a little chapbook, and I did it in kind of like a, a, a state in between uh, being awake and being asleep. That was the goal. It, so that I wouldn't think so much. <laughs> So, um, you know, to get out of the thinking mode. Um, so for both of you, it's a question for both of you, I'm wondering about the role of, of thought, the role of thinking, or how you get to that space. Like some, you know, it may be various, depending on the project you're working on, what poem you're working on, what moment you're in, uh, just in the creative process. I relate, I think I relate to the idea of going to I'm mean, thank you, I'm the Aquarius. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty season, right. Um, I think that's what pushed me towards what I'm calling pleasure, which is more um, directly sort of sex. Um, but then once I was starting to think about that, I realized, no, you're thinking just as hard at that moment as you are, I mean, you should be, right? Or you should be a little part. So that, it's hard for me to try to get outside of that, which becomes, for me, the vulnerable, or I have to give it to myself and 
So it's always a, it's always it's something I'm actually really most interested in in poems. My poems and maybe all poems to do is to reveal the thinking happening, but also to make it I mean, you say this word seductive and interesting because no one wants to just hear you think out loud. I mean, I don't. like no one wants to just your thoughts are pr uh, kind of a crazy kind of poem. <laughs> Not in a poem or just really ever. Like no, like you know, it, it's there's a there's a craft to it. Like you want to even speech, even in sentences. Like like, can you say a full sentence? I don't want to just hear you crack open your head. Like that's too much. You know, like I'd rather see something be shaped. Um, I'd rather see the best sort of effort. Um, so there's something about it that is there's something like Wizard of Oz about it where you see the part in the front and also there's the Wizard in the back. And so I'm often like. In my own poems, I'm often like touching like where do I reveal my poems? I realize this like, there's a moment where you reveal like the thinking of part of it, but there's a moment where I'm gonna pull back the, the, the curtain. Um, so that's like shifting. Like sometimes I want the curtain to come out really quickly. Um, sometimes I want the curtain never to appear, but but that's actually a kind of a construct. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question of thinking. I know I'm thinking as I'm doing all of this, and I can't not that's kind of that's just who I am. Like, that's just what it is. Like, so that's just what it is. Uh, I don't know. Scorpio, as soon as you say, uh, thinking out loud, I'm like, yeah, man, I, I will never read some of those poems out again. Um, <laughs> some of the newer poems. Because that, that is the question that I had through all those poems. Uh, and I, I thinking is fine. Uh, bearing witness to a mind, really any mind, is interesting to me. Um, there's a poem in the book that's like, well, you know, everybody really has a very original life very original story, so just to get a little witness of that, which is what I kind of get when I'm looking at people's poems, that's really enough. So it's indulgence that's the problem. So just as that might be a problem in a kid's poem who they're indulging in whatever, grief, joy, pleasure, uh, intelligence, that's my struggle often with the poems. It's like, I, I do want to see my own thinking laid bare, and I want to give it shape. The sign is really great for something like that. I'm trying to, I had you know, another but wind in the box, so it's like, okay, the thinking is sort of like that. It's just everywhere, it's you know, almost clear, it's not quite clear, it takes all these shapes, and you're just trying to put it down in this little box of language. So that's like the art question, but let me tell you a story too. It's just about like, you know, me and art. <laughs> so uh, this other friend is a poet, uh, a woman about my age, and she has a kid, and she's an artist as well, kind of an experimental writer. So we're like doing this thing together, we're judging something, and we started talking about art, and she was like, yeah, yeah, you know, send me, send me some of the stuff you've been doing. I'm like, yeah, you know, I go to take a drawing class a couple of times a week, so I just got stacks of these drawings. And she was like, yeah, let me see what you're up to. So then I sent her some of the drawings, and I didn't hear back from her. And the man was like, man, were you that bad? I sent her like the best of the stuff I had. So then finally I was like, hey, uh, what'd you think about the, the drawings? And she was like, yeah, they were cool, but they were nude, you know? And so I felt very weird about engaging you dear colleague and fellow poet over the fact that you sent me new people. And I was like, well, wait, though, it's drawings, man. Like, if it's a good drawing, you shouldn't care what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So that is, for me, I, coming out of that experience, I was just like, well, there are some people who maybe would prioritize thinking, which is a notion of like what the drawings represent, and where they fit in a certain kind of climate, over like feeling, which is just looking at it and saying, like, oh, that, that's really cool. I just love the feeling in that drawing. So there's some people who would prioritize the first thing. That's where I put her, <laughs> as a person who's like inappropriate. But I'm a person who would prioritize feeling over thinking and say I would be able to make something that I would give to you and you would be like, I can feel my way through it. I feel both the integrity in it, I also feel what you're sort of unpacking there. But if you prioritize your thinking, you know, you can get enough logic to get out of that basic feeling. So in my poems and in general, that's what I'm often contending with. Like indulgence for me would be feeling so deeply that I don't really think at all. I don't think about what you think. But the balance between thinking and feeling, continuing with those things, and prioritizing feeling, that I have to be clear, like I'm definitely on that side of the tracks, um, but trying to like negotiate that to find an appropriate shape for it. Uh, again, I don't know if that's a poetry answer or if that's a, a general audience answer. Like, um, uh, something about that reminds me about sound. Like, like I have this thing about argument, like syntax versus is work is what I'm often thinking about um, or feeling about in my poems, meaning um, a sentence can do two things, at least two things. It can give you information or it can just sound good. 
right? And so I'm often like going back and forth. Um, and I think, and I, and I, I kind of, as you're talking about art, I'm thinking, I'm realizing I kind of think about it through visual art, um, crudely, you know, not yet an art story, but I think about it in terms of like, you know, sort of a landscape painting that is, you know, so sort of purely um, sort of conservative. It gives you a kind of landscape you understand what's happening versus sort of something more abstract um, that someone could describe as indulgent that is just sort of like being more gestural or figurative. Um, and there shouldn't be a tension that we should be able to move, like what's interesting for me is being able to move between those two places. But going back to the poet, like to the poem, um, I'm often like sort of uh, restless to bring Carl Phillips in this space, um, restless between like, how deeply am I gonna get to the sound, or just like indulge in the sound. Like that's what I like, poetry is beautiful because it just, it just sounds good, like it just sounds amazing. And not, all, not always ple pleasant things, you know, like pleasingly so, sometimes it's hard, um, but it also has to make a kind of sense, right? It has to, there's like, it is, it is a sense, it is, a, it is words, you know, back to back. So I'm often like kind of going back between those two places. Um, and I think uh, I probably do choose the, the other side, the, like the argument at the end of the day, because I'm like, well, how dare I just put up like a couple of sounds on people, uh, this for me, like put sounds on a piece of paper and, and demand people read it. Like, I hope they walk away with something, you know, like something that, that is useful to them, that more that is more than just, that is just more than just the, the pleasure of the sound. Uh, I, I think that when, in my experience of reading out loud or hearing poetry, um, when it affects me very deeply is when I feel something in my body. And sometimes I don't know why, but it comes from that kind of sign, resonance, softness. Um, you bring up, I don't really have a question for him, but I made some notes about um, working in different genres. Um, and you've probably been asked this a million times parents, but I, I do want to ask you about the relationship between um, what you do in uh, painting and drawing and what you do in poetry. They occupy the same part of the imagination. And you also play, you play the piano, yeah? Uh, I just messed around. I can't really no. Not in public. Okay, we'll forget that last part. But so those, so I'm, I'm curious about the relationship, if there is a relationship. And, and Ricky, I'm, I know that you are often in collaboration with folks working in um, different genres, me mediums, um, artistic forms. So I'm curious about what draws you to that and also how it transforms or how it affects your, your po poetic, your poetry. Um. I mean, I have said this before in interviews, I think it's on mine somewhere with Parmi, uh, about essentially, like, I just am trying to stay busy. So whatever that uh, is, it's what I do. So the piano is a good example of that. Like, I just, it's something where there are no stakes, so I can really just cut free, and I'm just sort of feeling my way through it. Like, it's just a, a great basic sound. And I guess I've been playing it for about 20 years, and I, you know, I fool people here and there. But always when I'm just sort of relaxed. So the great thing about it is that there is no sense of ever trying to be like good at it, really. And so art is similar. Like at this point, it's just exercise. It's a way of seeing, and essentially just sort of getting the mind to not be on words because they usually are on words. So I say all that to say before I tell the story. It's like I just think that everybody should have some manner of creative practice. And for me, I just try not to be real picky about what that practice is. And so, so the story with even sending the woman the pictures, you know, otherwise they just are sitting in my studio or they never come out of the book, you know, that kind of thing. And so an opportunity to sort of share them with another artist is like enough for me. That's not true with poems. Like, you know, the last poem I read, uh, terribly, blah, 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 you know, I wrote that in December. I was so excited and I was like, that's it, man. He's out of there. This is my final poem. I should send it to the New Yorker, you know. <laughs> and I was like, well, I shouldn't just send it one poem. That'd be brilliant. So I sent two others. So that's how I got back to even looking at those points and thinking about them. Because I sent them in and it was like, you know, this is it, I'm not gonna write anymore. And then he, you know, he published that and took the others too. But that happens in a way that's always sort of undercutting what I'm trying to do here when I'm writing poems. Like, that's why I would share the news with you, because 
it's like, books are great, but it really is, you know, poems, and it is just the gesture of trying to make something. So I feel great when people, you know, show up and want to hear it, and I, I do have, like, a business savvy, so I know I got to be something from the book. But I'm also suggesting, like, what I'm about is really not about books, and it really ain't about prizes either. It's like writing as a way to live, and I think, like, everybody has to have something like that, even if it's not poems, or drawing. I mean, I, I'm not even going to define it for you, but I generally believe that that's really how people should live. So the wrinkle in that story is like my brother, who's great and super focused and like a great dad and responsible at work. And I'm like, oh, what does he do? I don't know what he does, you know? And he's, maybe he does have something, but I don't know it. So I think like, he's at work, is he like, I don't know, I have no idea, it mystifies me. So he really does challenge this theory that everyone must have some kind of like discernible creative practice in their day to day. Because like, he must have something in order for me to believe that he is you know, happy. I think he must have something to be happy. But I don't really know what it is. So I like that, a challenge like that, coming into what I think of as like a fundamental. I need those little wrinkles in my theories about the universe. But, um, I mean, you know, some psychoanalysts would say that it happens. Like if you don't have a practice like that, it happen in your dream life. So again, I don't mind that. I mean, it's not a judgment on him even. It's just to say, it's to say like my, I don't know what that creative act, creative act is exactly. Much like I'm saying, do we know what lyric is? Do we know what poems are? Do we know what poetics are? But it's just a question. Like we are, what I love involved in this, emphasizing the questions always over some notion of like resolution or some notion of answer. But, but it sounds like you're, you're, you're looking for your brother to have an artistic practice mm -hmm. because he may have a creative practice. I mean, that's right. a child is creating and raising a parent. Maybe we have to think differently about creating. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's an accountant. For somebody, like being an accountant is a great, I mean, it's not for me. But for them, I can imagine um, it, it's, it would be difficult. I get your point, but it's like for someone, um, like for the priest who, who, who is here, ever here, like that is their creative practice. No, I totally agree. I'm just saying, like, it's a, something that I can't name. It's my problem. It ain't his problem. Because he's happy. He's secure. He's <laughs> doing what he got to do. Got nothing to do with it. It's just me saying, like, if you said to me, what is your brother's creative practice that seems to sustain his basic happiness? And I would say, well, I know he's a good dad. I know he loves his kids. But that's still like, that relationship is dependent. And I'm saying it's about where I raise the kids. It's dependent on the kids. Like, you know, kids grow up and they move on. So it's sustainable in a certain way. But I'm asking about a creative practice that comes from within. You know, like, it's self-generated. And so that's what I can't answer. I know he must have something. But it, again, it's my problem, not his. Question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you in particular about um, about collaboration, about working with people, uh, folks working in dance and uh, visual art, and, and how that transforms your work. It does. That's what I can say. Um, I think for me, it's it's similar to I me. Mean, Terrence and I have similar. I guess I can just say it differently. Like for me, um, kind of goes back to the idea of thinking. I realize that I'm just like a you know, there are poets of image and poets of sound. I'm a poet of ideas. I have ideas. I have arguments that I'm not always persuaded by when I'm interested in like running the line down. Um, but again, it would be indulgent just to give you a list of my ideas. Like, oh my God, who wants that? Right? And my ideas sometimes exceed the poem, right? And so for me, it's like designing a class around the body, have these like enjoying <coughs> questions that will never be answered around the body. And I can write a couple of poems for the rest of my life, but that will be, in some ways, unsatisfying until I um, really live it out in my actual body, or do the class, or uh, maybe curate an event is another way to do it, or collaborate with a visual artist, or collaborate with a singer. Like those are new ways of, of like sharpening or honing my skills as a poet, uh, which is only another word to say maker. Um, but also it gets at the idea from another way. And for me, like Jericho Brown um, once said to me, of course, it, maybe I read it, but he said it to me, I forget, um, that poets should have like a, a, like a, a external vocabulary. Like I think for him, he would say that his is music, and like he thinks about poems through music. Um, and for me, I find that I want to think about it in a plethora of ways. So every time I collaborate with another person, or just every time I just literally just open up with a media, Let's go. <laughs> you know, I'm just always interested to see what I can find because I'm making 
what what I what happens to me in my, my mind, and this is what becomes exhausting, is that I make connections. Like I just practice a pedagogy connection, mm -hmm. and it becomes literally exhausting because I'm like, okay, that's like this, this is like that, this is like that, this is like this, this and this and this. And sometimes you need to stop that, go to sleep, you know, drink, a, you know, get some whiskey, do whatever you need to do to stop that. Um, but sometimes you have to like go in, and so my interest in um, curating is around that. My interest in um, visual art is around that. My interest, I play xylophone on the piano too, did you know that? Um, yeah, it's real deep. Uh, my interest in that, like I, I think that that is a deep connection to it, because it's, we'll get to it. But I think there's a deep like connection with that. Um, so it's, it's, part of it is quite selfish, but also part of it is quite selfless, because I'm actually interested in like, well this is what I know, this is the knowledge I have, quite limited, I can know quite a little bit in the grand scheme of the world, but I can offer this and you can offer that, and together we might make something pretty interesting. Can I say, I, I do think that that is the future. Uh, I was sort of talking to the graduate students today about it. I think originating just one of the students doing video stuff, but we were talking about mixed genre, so we talked about like a prose poem. What is a prose poem? It seems impossible. But what I do believe is like Ricky's approach to whatever the word is you want to use, collaboration, collage, hybridity, <coughs> that kind of thinking really is where we're going. Like all indications about how culture is overlapping suggest that everyone should be trying to think in as many different ways as possible and feel actually in as many different ways as possible. So I say that because this is when you think about like generational lines, like what does it mean to have grown up before internet, for you know, beepers, that sort of thing. So it's just like technological marks like that also mark other kind of things. So what I'll say is like, that's really hard for me because I do, like I'm, not, I'm doing piano and that has nothing to do with the poems. And I'm drawing, that has nothing to do with the piano. So very much segregated thing. So that could be because, you know, I grew up in military bases and got in the water, my mom was all about like, you know, <laughs> everything's very straight. That could be something like that. But I also put it also to a certain kind of like zeitgeist thinking, which is not about hybrid, that is like about like segregated things. And I would say, finally, when I applied to the University of Pittsburgh, I said this to everybody today, I was so dumb down in South Carolina that I had talked to anybody about it, and this was before the online stuff, so I had to write it out. And it was like, what would you like to get your MFA in? And I wrote, creative writing, which made perfect sense to me, like an MFA in creative writing, because it goes to this idea of like, it's all creative writing, and that's just a more generous way of thinking about it. So they, they put me in poetry. I don't know what the video was, but so I sent them poems and essays, and, crazy stuff I've been writing by myself because in South Carolina was <laughs> never have had any kind of like classes. But that logic I think is right and I sort of have, in order to teach, one is always trying to organize and sort of clarify things. But I don't think that that's the best way to move forward. I do think that what we're talking about and just the lifestyle of openness and movement through all genres and as I said, relationships, feeling, thinking, that's one of the things I admire and it's like I aspire to as a as an old dude thinking, but that is right, like this, this no change. change. I'll, I'll say before you're gonna say, Ricky, you, if you have questions, um, we will take some questions from the audience, but you do need to stand at a microphone. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you. I, I, I'm kind of fascinated that you, like I all, what you're describing, um, you, you see it as like a new thing, but I think of it as very old and ancient. Because I think, like, I think it's because I studied Latin, and I think, you know, it's like you had rhetoric, and you had, uh, you know, poetry. And the poetry had all the muses, but they were all, like, the notion of genre didn't exist. It was all, so hybrid to me feels very, very, very broken. It feels very, very ancient. So I, th I don't think we're disagreeing. I just think it's like, we're all going back to the same moment. And, and it doesn't have to be Western. You can even take it out of oh, Africa, you can go South Asia. But there's this whole moment where uh, this notion of, like, distinctions and discriminatory lines, I think, is a sort of a more modern, Invention that I've really, I think I've really needed all this fuck. I mean, you know, it's very queer, it's very like amorous and all this stuff. So it's interesting that we are returning back to that. And it seems new, there may be new channels um, to do it. Uh, but I often, like, I remember being in Latin class and having to translate, um, you know, poetry that was narrative but also would become lyric and then have to just translate Cicero and my Latin teacher saying, you have five minutes. So it's like, you have to do all that. So it feels like, it feels old to me, in, in, that, in, in a good way, because I want to be That's true, that's why I brought up uh, shifts in technology. Like certainly, Twitter has not always been no, next to us. Internet has not always been next to us. So as I said, someone who can remember like 
a world before that, and then being this world, I'm thinking about some of that has changed, and even though the practice and the thinking is ancient, we must say the speed of information and the speed of our relationships are sort of influenced by that. And I am saying that because I didn't grow up with that. I am contending with like how to fold that into a thing that I know is necessary and like possible for the future moving forward. So it's really a comment about me almost being 50, really important. <laughs> Are there questions from the audience? Hmm? Okay, I'm being informed that if there are no questions from the audience, it's a good time to end because we are over our time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.